of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Greetings, my brothers and sisters in Christ. All of us are one in the body of Christ. All of us who are baptized are members of the one household of faith, founded upon the rock of the papacy instituted by Christ and perpetuated, transmitted, and proclaimed, respectively, by the apostles, the fathers, the saints, and maybe we will be be among that fold too one day. So what shall we talk about today? Today is dedicated to Holy Saturday in the year of our Lord 2024. I would like to talk about the theme of Holy Week as we are on the cusp of Easter as well as the status of Louisa's writings and the work I'm doing at present to help explain the doctrines contained therein so as to understand within the context of scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterial teachings, the sublime knowledge and understanding that Christ conveys to us through all of the above. Where begin? Let us begin with what we have been experiencing throughout Lent every Friday that culminates on Good Friday and then actualizes new light in life on Easter Sunday. And what is that which has happened on every Friday and especially on Good Friday, if not the cross of Christ that is essential for the resurrection on Easter Sunday? There is no resurrection without a crucifixion. There is no Easter without a Good Friday. And there is no reign of God's will on earth as in heaven without the ephemeral reign of the evil one in his darkness on earth and in hell. In other words, darkness and the cross and death are part and parcel of eternal life. We cannot attain the light without the cross, and for this reason the Latinists, scholastics, quoted a beautiful statement, and it is, ad lucem per crucem, to the light through the cross. Naturally, without the resurrection, the cross is utterly meaningless. If Christ never resurrected, all of his passion, death, resurrection would have been useless. The cross draws its fecundity, its fruitfulness, its value, its merit from the light that emerged from Christ's body on Easter Sunday that is the source of all life, including the life of grace that the cross draws its power from. With respect to the resurrection, Jesus talks to Louisa about it quite often. In fact, I will share with you Mary's messages to Louisa on the resurrection and on days 28 and 29 in the Virgin Mary book entitled Virgin Mary in the kingdom of the divine will. I will share with you round 23 of Louisa's work, The Pious Pilgrimage of the Soul in Creation, popularly known as The Rounds in Creation. And I will share you of just a couple of 
excerpts from volume 36 and volume 5 on the resurrection. Then I will talk to you about Louisa's writings, their status, and the work I'm doing in translating in English what is a theological version, because this is my job as a theologian to help educate the faithful in theology, which includes all that which the church has approved in its documents and in its seals of approval, which embrace many of Louisa's works. First, day 28, child of my sorrows, listen closely to what your tender mother wishes to tell you. As my dear son breathed his last, he descended into the prism of limbo as the triumphant bearer of glory and joy to all the patriarchs, prophets, because I was inseparable from my son, not even death could take him away from me. So in my ardent sorrows, I followed him into limbo. Now, here Mary is talking about a spiritual bilocation. She was experiencing this in the womb of Anne. At least in the opening days of this same book, the Virgin Mary in the kingdom of the divine will, her soul would bilocate from the womb of Anne to the three divine persons, exchanging and requiting love. So you could imagine with what haste and glee and excitement she went in the mystical world or mystical literature approved by the church in, for example, the lives of St. Padre Pio, Anthony of Padua, Alphonse de Lugori, Picaret, St. Faustina Kowalska, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, Julian of Norwich, and the list goes on. All, all of these experienced soul locations, that is, their soul would be present in more places. Now, before the gift of living in the divine will was actualized, in the first creature conceived in sin, namely Louisa Picaret, in the late 1800s, no one could trans-temporally multi-locate with their soul in such a way that they they could impact concomitantly, that is, contemporaneously, or at the same time, all the lives in one eternal act. That was not possible before this gift was actualized in Louisa. That is, it was not possible in anyone conceived in sin before Louisa. It was possible in Adam and Eve, even in Jesus and Mary, who were conceived without sin. And had this gift. But no one received this gift apart from those four I just mentioned. St. Joseph, Jesus tells Louisa, however great a saint he was, St. John the Baptist, however great a saint he was, both of whom were sanctified in the womb, though conceived in sin, and never committed a sin throughout their lives, did not receive the gift of living in the divine will, but St. Joseph partook of the kingdom of the divine will. There's a difference, and I make this clear in my public, the divine will prayer book, as well as in my doctoral dissertation. I allude to this distinction, but I go more explicitly into it in my divine will prayer book. The kingdom of the divine will is the fruit of the gift of living in the divine will and not vice versa. So Joseph, who did not possess the gift of living in the divine will, nonetheless received the kingdom from the reflection of those who lived in it, namely Jesus and Mary, during his time at the home of Nazareth. And I believe that Joseph will be part of that hierarchy in heaven of the sons of the divine will by virtue of having lived in its kingdom but not having possessed the gift. In other words, he received passively this kingdom. He did not create it. Joseph received it from Jesus and Mary, who created within their respective souls a kingdom that contains all the acts of all creatures by their active divine acts. Joseph did passive acts, welcoming the fruits, hence Jesus' expression, 
to Louisa that Joseph lived from the reflections of Jesus and Mary. And uh, these bilocational acts um, can be done in real time. And this was done in the past by saints like St. Anthony of Padua, Ant Alphonse de LaGuardia. In fact, these two did physical, not just spiritual bilocations long before the gift of the living in the divine world was actualized in Louisa. But this is a, there's a difference here. There's a difference between your soul being in two places at once at the same chronological time. That is, this day, let's take Holy Saturday, right? March 30th, 2004. Suppose I'm living before the gift was ever actualized in Louisa. I wish to pray for a soul in purgatory and also pray for my parents who are still alive. God rest their souls, they're not. But assuming they are on earth, they're still alive. I also want to pray for my grandparents in purgatory. That's assuming they're there. Okay. Can I, I do it? Of course. Could the saints in the past do it? Of course. That's a form of bilocation of your soul. You are, by offering up sacrifice, by offering up the Mass, which is a timeless event that you can participate in and receive the fruits from, impact through the fruits of these souls in purgatory, as well as your parents on earth, knowing that purgatory is outside of time and space, but you are influencing them through these acts of yours, through your mass, through your sacrifices, through your prayers in this present moment. All the saints in the past could do that. It is another thing altogether to go into the past. And this is only possible after the gift is actualized in the soul. Go into the past and influence the acts of Adam and Eve in real time while they are yet on earth or while they are yet even before going to earth in Eden, while you are alive 6,000 years later today. That could not be done by any saint in the past. And this is what makes the gift of living in the divine will unique and why Jesus tells Louisa it is the greatest gift God had, could ever give any creature at any time forever. Because it restores within the human soul, which is a property of human nature, the latent potencies that have been suspended for 6,000 years since the expulsion of Eden on account of original sin. And in that actualization of latent potencies in the soul, namely the intellect, the memory, and the will, all three can trans send by the power of God's one eternal will at work in them all time and space so much so that every creature that existed exists and will exist is in real time today being influenced by these acts. Now this may boggle the human mind because we cannot fathom with our finite minds that are literally confined to time and space effects that transcend both only by understanding through analogies and through teachings of the church we come to an understanding of it not a full exhaustion of this reality but a better understanding of it take for example by way of analogy in a teaching of the church jesus won redemption here you have jesus christ who took upon himself a human nature while retaining his second person of the trinity his one divine person and with 33 years on earth and nine months in the womb, all of which were laden with suffering and sacrifice, selflessness and love, he redeemed every human being of all time that was before him, that lived during his time and that has yet to come after him and that exists today. And not only that, he redeemed all the angels. He redeemed the Blessed Mother. He redeemed every rational and irrational being there is. Everything in the material order he redeemed. You may say, how is this possible in just 34 years? His life had a beginning, his life had an end. 
How could he go back in time? And this is one of the reasons why the Jews picked up rocks and tried to kill him. He said, how can you say, I am? I, were you born before Adam? They misunderstood. They didn't have this understanding that Jesus possessed. And what makes me, what is the word, I'm um, mesmerized, um, starstruck, is that Jesus spoke to them on terms that they could understood but that they could not understood if they were not open to a deeper understanding. So he didn't dummy down the sublime teachings to the point where they would be trampled upon. Like Jesus says, never throw your, swirl, your pearls before swine. And this is why Jesus never said a word to Herod, who was full of sensuality and promiscuousness. Jesus knew if he responded to the maybe like 30-something questions Herod asked him, it would fall on deaf ears, so he didn't waste his breath. However, when Pilate asked, he answered, because there was hope in Pilate, you see. And that's why Jesus told Pilate, the one who, those who turn me over to you have a greater sin than yours. And that included Herod, right? As well as the Sanhedrin, who gathered together for a kangaroo court, breaking the Mosaic law after midnight without a full assembly, there were several violations in this assembly that condemned and excommunicated our Lord. And Jesus saw through this hypocrisy, but nonetheless chose his words wisely. He wouldn't waste them. So this trans-temporal ability of the soul to go into the past, present, and future concomitantly and impact all things as if they were present today is the fruit of the one eternal will of the Father that operated in Adam and Eve's intellect, memory, and will in their human nature, as well as in those of Jesus and Mary. Take, for example, and I'll conclude this point here and move on to the next, Daniel chapter 3, verse 57 and following. Chapter 3, verses 57 and following. Sun and moon bless the Lord. Stars of heaven bless the Lord. Frost and chill bless the Lord. Dew and rain bless the Lord. Here the soul is doing its rounds in creation, but it's not going into the past. It's not going into the future. It's glorifying by locating its soul in and through the elements to praise God in its real time. Confined to its actual chronological time. Excuse me. Clear my throat here. <clears throat> and um, Jesus, when he redeemed mankind, this is how he did it. His one eternal will, that, that's a property of the one divine nature of the three divine persons, was the motive force operating it in and through every human action of his intellect, memory, and will. So the divine intellect, memory, and will that comes from the Father and the Spirit and himself was animating, impacting, directing, empowering, diffusing the effects of all the acts of his human intellect, memory, and will. And this one eternal will of the three divine persons, as well as intellect and memory of the three divine persons, which is one, alone enabled this transtemporal activity in his human nature. The same reality happens with those souls who live in the divine will that come after Louisa, beginning with Louisa, or that came with Adam and Eve before sin and Jesus and Mary who were conceived without and knew no sin. All right, on that note, back to Mary. You see how with theology you can easily get lost in so many different avenues because it's such a rich and deep scholastic, patristic, West Indies, 2,000-year combination of beautiful Greek and Latin teachings. Okay, so here Jesus tells Louisa. I'm sorry, Mary's revealing this to Louisa. 
As my son breathed his last, he descended into the prism of limbo as the triumphant bearer of glory and joy to all the patriarchs, prophets, the first father, Adam, dear St. Joseph, my holy parents, and all those who had been saved by virtue of the foreseen merits of the future Redeemer. Because I was inseparable from my son, not even death could take me away from him. So, in my ardent sorrows, I followed him into limbo and witnessed the rejoicing and thanksgiving which that great host of souls all offered my son who had suffered so much for them. Indeed, his first step was directed toward them to beatify them and bring them with him to heavenly glory. So with Jesus' death there began the conquests and glories for him and for all those who loved him. And this dear child symbolizes the manner in which all conquests and glories and joys begin in the divine order for the soul who makes its will die in union with the divine will even in the face of life's greatest sorrows. Okay, now what does this mean? This, the will must die in union with the divine will, even in the face of life's greatest sorrows. Okay, the human will does not die. Just like Jesus says, unless the grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it does not produce much fruit. The grain doesn't die. This is a figurative expression. Just like the caterpillar does not die in the cocoon, but in that darkness, which is essential for light, like Good Friday is essential for Easter Sunday, like the death of Christ and being lain in the tomb was essential for his rising and ascending into heaven, it doesn't die, it brings about a transformation. So the human will does not die in the divine will. It undergoes a radical transformation. It continues to exist for all eternity. Just like the wheat that falls in the ground, roots, then a shoot, then leaves, then fruits, branches, etc. So the life of the seed continues, but in a radically transformed manner, just like the caterpillar with the butterfly, just like the human will with the divine will. Mary adds, even though the eyes of my soul, and I never lost sight of him, during those three days in which he was in the sepulcher, I so yearned to see him risen that in my ardent love I kept repeating, rise, my glory, arise, my life. My desires were so ardent and my yearning so inflamed that my human nature was completely consumed in love. Now, when this yearning, I saw my dear son accompanied by this great host of souls leaving limbo and returning to the sepulcher. It was the dawn of the third day, and just as all nature wept over him, now it rejoiced with him, so much so that the sun anticipated its course to witness the event of my son's resurrection. But what a surprise it was to see that before resurrecting, he showed this great host of souls from limbo his most sacred humanity covered with blood, wounded and disfigured for love of them, exactly as it was when he was on the cross. All were deeply moved and gratefully contemplated the excess of his love in the great miracle of the redemption. O oh, my child, how I long for you also to witness the event of my son's resurrection. He was clothed with majesty. And from his divinity, united to his humanity, his soul unleashed enchanting seas of light, of beauty that filled heaven and earth. Then triumphantly making use of his power, he commanded his deceased humanity to receive triumphant and glorious to immortal life. My dear Jesus triumphed over death, saying, Death, you will no have, have no longer power over me. You will no longer be death but life. With this truth, Jesus sealed the reality that he was in his one divine person, both God and man. And with his resurrection, he confirmed his doctrine, his miracles, the life of the sacraments and the life of the church. And he obtained the triumph over the human will of all souls that are weakened and almost dead to any good, so that the life of the divine will that was going to bring the fullness of holiness and all blessings to soul, my triumph over them. And in so doing, and by virtue of his resurrection, 
he also sowed the seed of the resurrection to eternal glory for all human bodies. My child, the resurrection of my son encloses everything, and it is the most solemn act that Jesus offered up for love of souls. The resurrection of my son encloses everything, and it is the most solemn act that Jesus offered up for love of souls. You may hear some Italian bells in the background, the seven o'clock hour here. I'll just let you hear a little bit of the bells in real time. <laughs> and I'm actually overlooking right now the balcony where I'm staying here in Italy of this monastery. And uh, you can hear the birds are anticipating the resurrection as well, as are the bells. Remember Louisa and the little bell that was always the voice of the divine will that would call to her. We have big bells here in Italy, you know, big loud bells. And uh, I love this beautiful experience because even though it's a sacrifice to be away from family, homeland, and so forth, knowing that you're doing the will of God always brings with it a joy that cannot be replaced. In fact, I'll parenthetically break away because something came to mind when I just spoke of that joy, and it comes right out of Louise's volume one that I'm translating. So I'll give you a little quick sneak preview up on this theme of the joy, because Louisa, and this is something I discovered, and that no one has ever shared with me before, and I don't think anyone has ever known this before. That's contained in volume one. Why is this possible? How is this possible? Because Louisa wrote a very poor Italian grammar, not that she was not smart. She was, she won a prize for the smartest girl in her class in first grade. But she didn't really go beyond that due to her lack of means and the culture in which she lived. It wasn't necessary at the time. But there was a time when she would go down to church before she lost her inability to walk. And she would spend two to three hours there in prayer. Okay, that's not new. And she would love to receive the sacraments. That was her greatest prize. That's not new. We knew that. And eventually, after she had the vision of Jesus at the age of 13 from her balcony, she, for intermittent moments, had what's called lockjaw. Jesus put the crown of thorns on her head, and it caused her such excruciating pain that she clenched her jaw so hard it locked and could not open for two to three days. And this happened several times, not just once. That's not new. We knew that, too. I spoke about this in my dissertation. This is what's new. The state in which she was in bedridden. She was in her bed for about 60 years, and the Lord would oftentimes at night normally from around 11 p.m. to midnight, up until 6 to 7 in the morning, all night long, she would be in a state of mystical transport, where her body would assume a rigid, heavy, immobile position, where no one could even move her limbs. She, was, she, she refers to herself as an unhewn stone. Unhewn stone. That's the best translation in English you can come up to match her Apulian dialect. She was basically like a piece of lead, but very heavy, and um, no one could move her. Now, we all know that this happened one when she was bedridden, but no one knew, to the very best of my knowledge, that this state of her immobility, her rigidity, her lack of consciousness, her state of suffering during this time, happened in her teenage years, even before she was bedridden. Now, how could people not know this? Because of the way she wrote. She, her sentences were very convoluted, mixed up. It's sort of like, to give, give you an understanding in English, me telling you, this is my intention to tell you that my mother told me to go to the store to fetch some bread and milk and eggs. And on the way to meet my aunt, tell my aunt what the mother said, and then come back and give my mother the eggs and milk and bread and 
tell my mother what the aunt said in reply. Okay, that's pretty easy to understand. This is how Louisa would sometimes say it. I went to the store to get some eggs and milk, and I saw my aunt. Because my mother told me to go and get um, bread, um, I did so, and then I told my mother what my aunt said, and then I came back and gave her the bread and eggs and milk. See how convoluted that is? It hides the actual sequence of what happened. And that happens a lot in volume one. You miss the sequence. So she does talk about the state of asopimento, which is a slumber-like state where her head would crouch down within her breast, her chest. And she would remain like that in a rigid state, suffering the crown of our Lord and other tremendous sufferings that he would later tell her came from him, not the devil. Yes, he allowed the devil to torment her, to help her grow in holiness like he did with Padre Pio and other great saints for, from the age of 13 to 14 and a half. But then they light him from 14 and a half to 16. But the sufferings in this state would come from him. Now, because she didn't map out the sequence very coherently, most people assume that this slumber-like state began when she was bedridden, but it didn't. And what I do is I cross-reference volume one, which needs a lot of cross-referencing to fully understand the sequence, to extrapolate the proper sequence. So in my footnotes, I show how this was happening. I, I say go to, I basically add numbers to volume one so you can, because volume one has no dates. So you can't say go back to this page or that page. You have to say which sentence, which line. So I group them by two or three paragraphs. And I'll refer you back to, let's say, paragraph 12, paragraph 20, paragraph 33. Say, look, this is where she talks in her teenage years of these events. And then she also brings into it her having this experience in the church after she walked to the church. So obviously, she was able to walk when this happened. And this happened many times. She said this would happen while she was still able to walk, either once a week or once every 10, 15 days or once every several months. Those are her exact words. Before she became bedridden. And this even happened in church after she received communion in front of everybody, which embarrassed her. And, okay, so I wanted to bring this out because she tells Jesus, the priest would come, the first time the priest came, at the request of her parents, who were really beside themselves, when they accidentally saw her in the state. She tried to hide it from them, but it didn't succeed for long. And when the priest called her soul back to her body, which was bilocating in the state of suffering and rigidity, he commanded her soul, and he made a sign of the cross, and it obeyed him only. Then she would regain consciousness, her limbs would be loosened, but she would be exhausted. And then she would say, and I'm going to quote to you from this translation of volume one. Though I recall being resigned to God's will, when I realized the priest had freed me from the state of rigidity, I experienced a certain regret for not having died. But I also experienced a joy. She wanted to be with the Lord, that's a regret for not having died, but she also wanted to remain on earth. She, there's the joy to suffer, to save souls, and to appease the Lord's justice, and to alleviate Christ's sufferings. The reason Christ allowed her to share the, share the crown of thorns was because she didn't want him to suffer, and she wanted him to allow her to take upon herself. So he conceded her request. So after the, conf the confessor had left and I was freed from my state of rigidity, I would eventually return again to my previous state. Thus it happened that after there had passed a week or 15 days or months, in the daytime this state would every now and again suddenly come upon me. And from it, I was occasionally able to free myself. But very, very often when I was caught off guard by my family, as I mentioned before, my family would call upon the confessor. They did this so, especially because everyone in the family believed that I would never again be able to recover from the state. 
but they witnessed him freeing me thereof for the first time. And on occasion it happened that when I went down to the church to pray, I would again return to my previous state of rigidity. And the family, coming to know of this, would call upon the confessor, who would then free me thereof. Now until then it had never occurred to me that a priest would be required to free me from such a state, or that its related suffering was an extraordinary occurrence. It is true that when I would lose consciousness, I would, lo- I would see Jesus Christ, but I attributed this to the good of our Lord, saying to myself, I can see how good the Lord is to me. And in the state of suffering, he comes to give me strength. Otherwise, how could I endure such suffering? And who else would give me strength? And it is also true that when such a state was about to occur in the morning or during the commun- during communion, see, right there, she's at ass. Jesus would tell me so. And he would also relate that the suffering I would experience in that very state would come from Jesus. And then she goes on. But you see here, she says that when it happened that I went down to the church to pray, I would again return to my state of rigidity. So this happened right in the church. And she goes on to say this would happen from a week to 15 to several months, during the daytime mostly. So my the reason I brought this up was because she felt a joy after she was re- relieved from the state of suffering at the request of the priest. But at the same time, she regretted it. She wanted to be with the Lord on the one hand, but she also wanted to alleviate his sufferings. Because when she was not suffering, then he would take on the sufferings again. And the reason I went to that is because I said, the bells, it's beautiful to be here in Italy, and there's a joy, you know, there's a joy in suffering, there's a joy in sorrow. As long as you're fulfilling or you are given the awareness that your intention is to fulfill the will of God, then it's worth it. But back to the resurrection scene. Blessed Virgin Mary and Jesus coming out of the sepulcher. She adds, with this triumphant act, Jesus to seal the reality that he was in his one divine person, both God and man. The resurrection of my son encloses everything, and it is the most solemn act that Jesus offered up for love of souls. I wish to speak to you as a mother who loves her child very much. I wish to tell you what it means to do the divine will and to live in it. The example is given to you by my son and by me. Our life was strewn with pains, poverty, humiliations, to the point of me seeing my die amidst sorrows. But in all this, the divine will excelled. The divine will was the life of our sorrows. The divine will was the life of our sorrows. There's the joy through which it made us feel triumphant and victorious. In fact, on day 29, I'm reading day 28 now, Mary would tell Louisa that after Jesus' resurrection, her sorrows and joy, her sorrows were converted into seas of grace, light, and love. But back to day 28, Mary adds, The divine was was the life of our sorrows through which it made us feel triumphant and victorious, so much so that it changed death into life. In experiencing the great blessings of the divine will, we had such interior resolve that we voluntarily exposed ourselves to sufferings, just like Louisa did. For having the divine will in us, over which no one had any power, we knew that no one had power over us. Thus suffering was in our power, which we invoked as our nourishment and conqueror in the work of redemption in order to purchase souls. 
in order to purchase for the entire world all the blessings God had prepared for it. Now, dear child, if you allow the divine will to become the center of your life and especially of your sorrows, you can be certain that sweet Jesus will use you and your sorrows to administer help, light, and grace to the entire universe, the entire universe. Therefore, have courage, for the divine will can do great things wherever it reigns. In all circumstances, reflect yourself in me and in your sweet Jesus and forge ahead. Now I will share part of day 29. She relates, After the death of my son, I withdrew to the Senegal together with beloved John and Magdalene. But my heart was pierced with sorrow because among the apostles only John was with me, and in my sorrow I said, And the other apostles, where are they? And as they heard that Jesus had died, touched by special graces, they were all moved to tears, and one by one, like fugitives, they gathered around me, surrounding me like a crown. With tears and sighs, they asked for my forgiveness. For head, and for having so cravenly abandoned their master. Now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to pause here. Mary is talking to all of us here. We are no better than the apostles who have fled our Lord in his lowest moment. In some time in life, we are guilty of this, some more than others. But the beautiful message that Mary is conveying to you through this passage here is that you are not to focus on that which God has forgiven, provided you ask for his forgiveness. See, God wants to forgive you, but unless you ask, he cannot. And that is why now is the time to confess our sins in this novena of divine mercy. Because the first Sunday after Easter, when it comes, will last only a day. And unless we have confessed and received our Lord sacramentally on that Vigil Mass Saturday night or on that Sunday, the first Sunday after Easter, which is the same day, feast day in which Louisa was born, first Sunday after Easter, that is, we cannot receive a total remission of all sin and punishment, a plenary indulgence. Yes, the Church offers plenary indulgence on certain conditions, but this is the mother of all plenary indulgences, the Divine Mercy Feast Day. All that's required is confession and communion. The Church recommends that we add to that prayers for the Pope and um, an act of mercy, which could be a rosary for the salvation of souls, for souls in purgatory, or a half hour before the Blessed Sacrament. There's a handbook on indulgences as to the different pious acts you can choose here. But what's essential, what makes it valid, is confession and communion. Now, confession has to be with contrition. Why do I say that? Because the Church teaches us, and this is also in not just the, the magisterial documents on the sacrament of penance, but also in the catechism, Attrition alone takes away grave and venial sin. Attrition, with an A, does not. Attrition is this, is asking sorrow for fear of going to hell. It does not take away grave sins. It only takes away venial sins. To give you a better understanding between the difference of contrition and attrition, consider Peter and Judas Iscariot. Judas had attrition. Peter had contrition. Judas committed a grave mortal sin. St. Peter created uh, um, committed a grave mortal sin. He denied the Lord three times. That's grave. That's a sin against the Holy Spirit. Judas did the same thing. His sin was more grievous, but they were both grave. They were different levels, of course, of gravity, 
in a sin. Nonetheless, they both needed contrition to be forgiven because this was a grave sin on the part of both. Peter rose to the occasion, like did the other apostles, who wept, as Our Lady relates here, and the forgiveness. And she forgave them, and Christ her forgave them, not sacramentally. She doesn't have the powers to sacramentally forgive. Only a priest does. But nonetheless, they were bishops and priests. They were sacramentally forgiven. How? No one has ever asked that question, have they? They forgave each other. They exchanged the sacrament of confession with each other. That's how they were sacramentally forgiven. And they had contrition. Judas could have done that. But what did he do? Afraid of going to hell. But he did not have contrition, which is the love of God, which is proven by a resolution to serve him. So Judas took his own life and he ended up in hell, the same place he was sorry of going to. What a paradox. Now, let me explain to you how you know whether or not you have contrition or attrition. Okay, I explained that attrition is the fear of hell. Contrition is the love of God manifest with a firm resolution. So when you go to the sacrament of confession and you tell the priest your sins, he's asks, he asks you to make an act of contrition. And that's when you are to manifest both attrition and contrition. And the best formula in the English-speaking language is the one that I was raised with in the 60s. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, for I detest all my sins. I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. That's attrition. For I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. But most of all, because I love you, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. That's contrition, but it's not yet perfect. Something's missing. I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace. There it is. There is the perfect contrition. To confess my sins, to do penance, and to amend my life. Amen. So you have all three elements in that beautiful act of contrition. Attrition, I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. Contrition, but most of all because I love you, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. And perfect contrition, or with the resolution, I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace. Attrition, contrition, perfect contrition. Okay? So, Mercy Sunday is approaching, and this is a beautiful time for us, especially in these dark days, to be prepared because you never know what can happen in the days ahead. Every Mercy Sunday could be your last, and that's how you should look at it. So you should make a very good preparation for it in the week that is ahead of us. And I'll conclude with Mary's words on the resurrection before imparting to you my blessing. Beloved child, as you know, I was present at the resurrection of my son. But I did not say a word to anyone. As I waited for Jesus to reveal himself in his gloriously and triumphantly risen majesty and humanity. The first one to see him risen was the fortunate Magdalene. Then the other pious woman and all came to me telling me that they had seen Jesus risen and that the sepulchre was empty. I listened to them all. With a spirit of assured victory, I confirmed them all in the faith of the resurrection. By evening, almost all of the apostles had seen him risen. And they all felt within themselves a spirit of victory in having been called to be Jesus' apostles. Dear child, what a change in scene it was for the apostles who symbolized those who initially let themselves be dominated by the human will, who run away and abandon their master and in fear and fright hide. Indeed, Peter had reached the point of denying his master. Oh, if if they had been dominated by the divine will, they would never have fled their master. But with courage and a spirit of assured victory, 
they would have never left his side. They would have felt honored to give their lives to defend him. Now, dear child, my beloved Jesus spent 40 days in his risen humanity on earth. Very often he appeared to his apostles and disciples to confirm them in the faith and to reassure them of his resurrection. And when he was not with the apostles, he was with his mother in the cenacle, surrounded by souls who had come out of limbo. But at the end of the 40 days, Jesus instructed the apostles and instructing them, entrusting them to me, his mother, as their guide and instructor. He promised to send us the Holy Spirit. I'll conclude with that. May God bless you and keep you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.